um, we uh, we came along in 2015, and the idea is we wanted to basically have a look at the current understanding, whether the numbers had increased. Well, we know that increased, but you know, put some number, put some real numbers around what people said were going on. So, um, and while there was nothing done in the West Kim, where the East Kim, we've had a little bit of work done because uh, there's been a uh, there's been a um, egg harvesting program there for some time, and part of the requirements for determining there is that they had to do annual surveys, but um, nothing done in the area that we were interested in. So what we did was use the or what I did was use the Northern Terror experience to try and sort of inform how and, and why and where we go about doing our surveys. Um, they, they've had an intensive research program going since, um, since hunting stopped back in uh, 1970. So um, clearly we, we had a good uh, baseline, comparative baseline next door to, to make some comparisons with. And uh, some of the recent papers, or not so recent now, but around 2000, though, the, the researchers there were, were comfortably saying that they thought that essentially the crocodile population in terms of abundance had recovered. And they were sort of back up at numbers that, that they would expect pre-hunting. So, our expectation was that we'd find a similar pattern in, uh, in Western Australia. So, now as I said, um, although there'd been nothing done in the West Kimberley, the East Kimberley had had some work done. So, that was the first place that I looked at um, information to try and get you know, a handle on was there anything different going on in, um, in inside the Kimberley uh, uh, crocodile populations, and you can see that. Um, while while it was a very slow recovery between sort of just post post hunting through to um, 2000, after that it basically escalated quickly. So and certainly from you know over the last 15 years, there's been a, a very linear um, increase in, in, in crocodile numbers. So essentially, that's what I started with as my base, and I said, okay, am I going to see the same thing, or what will I see when uh, when we do the surveys? So the West Kimberley surveys that were done by Messel were done back in 1978 and 1986, and it was just it was a different time and place. You know, you, to, to, to try and replicate that would just be impossible for, for any number of reasons. So, um, and you know, he produced a series. His colleagues produced a series of 20 monographs that essentially mapped out in detail everything they'd done and where they'd gone. You know, over every major river system across Queensland, Northern Territory, and the Kimberley. It's just a spectacular piece of work. Anyway, it essentially made our job relatively easy because the idea was that we, we there was enough information for us to replicate his surveys as closely as possible so that any of the sort of comparisons we would come up with were essentially like with like. So anyway, we uh, because we didn't have the resources to, to, to do the scale that, that Harry's done, we, uh, we had to concentrate on particular areas and we chose um, an area with the Prince Regent and the uh, Rail Hunter River was because uh, They've been recognised by, by Messel and others as areas where most of the, the necessary breeding habitat exists in the West Kimberley. So, for those of you who are not familiar with that part of the world, um, these are the two river systems that we uh, that we chose, and, and that's for an to give an idea location. Um, Prince Region also sits within Camden Sound Marine Park, so that's that's really the system I'm talking about today because uh, the whole remit of the Wedge project was to, to just do that. that Particular system. Now, I do have data for that, and it's been worked up, but that'll be part of a, um, a more expansive peer-reviewed paper that's coming out. So, so as I said, we had some wonderful maps put together by Messel and, and his crew, um, which gave us um, made it easy for us to, to plan what we were going to do. Um, I'll tidy one of these up, but the idea was that you know he. he the level of detail was there that he, he blocked out all the sections of the river systems that he went to. Um, and so the idea is we were able to sort of replicate going to the same areas and we had a sense of how much how much time was going to be involved in taking that. And, and each of his maps went down to a finer detail where he basically had every kilometre mapped out on the rivers that he went to. So we were able to, to show that we were starting and finishing at the same places that he did. So um, all of this about trying to make sure that any of the... Um, uh, results we got were directly comparable. So, and uh, we had a, we had three three objectives, but the main objective was essentially to update the abundance and size structure, which is the, the, the data you get from uh, uh, <coughs> spotlight surveys, which is the, the methodology that we use. So, um, now the dots will represent years, so you can see we've got the two 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 surveys by Messel ten 
sort of 10 years apart and then you know, a substantial period of time before ours, so you know, there's not much you can do about that. But anyway, it would be interesting to see. So the, this is the type of data that we were looking at. These are just two of the ta classic table. You've got the, the size of the crocodiles there, um, the number of crocodiles obviously in these, these, um, uh, these variables here are just the location of the crocodiles, basically um, shallow water on the edge of bank is sort of where you found most of them, okay? So the idea is we're just going to build up our own information on that. Um, as I said, we use spotlight surveys. Uh, it's the same thing, a methodology that was developed and, and basically quantified um, rigorously by Harry Messel and it's been used ever since. So um, we, uh, we took the boat that's attached to the deep ore vessel. We've got a 22 metre catamaran that operates um, full time in the season up there. Um, a, few, a few sort of specialty numbers you're doing it. We paint the whole front third of the boat in this really cool paint that absorbs light. So, and, um, and in fact, it's absorbed light so well there's actually a raining there you can't see. So, um, but, and, the, and the other, as I say, because the other, the other safety feature put in there was a sort of railing you could lean on and the person's holding the spotlight in case you have a situation where a crowd trying to jump up or whatever, but it never happened, so it was fine. Um, and the other sort of sub project that came out of this, it wasn't really our project per se, but as is often the case, I spent a lot of time talking to researchers in, in the Northern Territory, crocodile researchers, to get some background and just sort of familiarise with the stuff that's going on anyway. Turned out that they were running a project looking at um, the genetics of, of crocodiles at a national level. Um, and I said, well, hey, we're going up there, we'll get some, uh, we'll get some samples for you. And so we've basically started a, a collaboration along those lines. And then uh, and then Danny Barrow, who was the, the head ranger, um, who, who was basically my, uh, I should say I was his sidekick rather than the other way around, but anyway, we, um, he said, oh, well, I've been wanting to, to, to try out a biopsy sampling pole. So um, he, he put together this pole and we said, all right, well, let's do it because it's got to be a damn sight easier and safer than trying to wrangle crocodiles to get a, a snip off them. So um, I've actually got, I might have to pop out of this just for a second. Yes, it should just go. Good. So this is the biopsy pole in action. It's just a very, very short video. Of it. That's a crop there. This is the end of the pole. The pole pan. Yep. <laughs> so that's how you get a sample. It was really, really cool, man. The only moment we have is a bit dodgy. We we saw what we thought was a small crocodile on the side of the river, and we went right, right on the banks, of course, we went over there and went over the top to do it. It was sort of over four metres. Like, Check back up! <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it was fine. Yeah, so, um, Sorry, so it, it was clear which part of the crocodile Oh, the tail, actually, the thick, the thick part of the tail there, yeah. So, it worked really, really well. We probably had a 98% efficiency, so. Um, in fact, it's worked out well that we've uh, I've put together a, um, a manuscript and it's gone to the Science Journal as a methodology. So while, while the, the individual bits and pieces, there's nothing unique about that, it actually turns out nobody in crocodile land has ever used that. They, they go through the shenanigans of wrestling crocs to get tissue sams and thought, well, this is a much better way of doing it. So. Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, that's Surveys. So, I had, I decided not to spend any time on it, but we, uh, through the help of Shane French and the GIS crew, I, I got hold of a really nifty um, electronic data collection system. Uh, it's a, um, an add-on to the uh, ArcGIS stuff. It's a Esri field collector and ends up basically electronic data collection. It just worked an absolute treat. So, um, I just had an iPad as my, uh, as my data collection for him, and I just was plotting the crocodiles as we go, and then get back to the boat, upload it, and then I could just pop up my uh, Windows screen and just look at all the plots as it's unfolding. And anyone, anyone who had the password and whatnot could do it anyway. So this is, this is the kind of plot you get out of it. So um, the bottom line is that's, that's every crocodile we counted in the Prince region in the survey. Um, and you can see there's a hell of a lot of crocodiles. So it wasn't a place you wanted to fall over the side, that's for sure. Um, it, you can't really see that well here, and it's not designed to do that, but I also scaled the dots here, so large dots are large crocodiles and small dots are small crocodiles, but anyway. So we ended up counting 708 crocodiles, which included a bunch of, a bunch of uh, hatchlings as well, so. Yeah. All right, so yeah, hatchlings, the first thing. So 
each of these dots, I know it's a bit hard to see, but hopefully you can. This this is essentially the mouth, the mouth of the um, Prince Regent, so that's sort of outside it. There's a, a north and a south arm, and then that's the main creek. So that's the first half. It's too long to fit on one, one graph, and then so that that essentially hooks onto there. So the bottom line is that's the entire river. So as you can see, most of the um, uh, most of the hatchlings we found were all up this upper upper river part, and that that sort of accords with what, what what's already known as crocodiles. It's the uh, upper reaches where there's access to fresh water and whatnot, and, where, and, and, and access to nesting, basically good nesting habitat. So that's where that's where you would generally expect to find um, uh, uh, recruits or hatchlings. Anyway, the other rivers here, um, we did find a few a few uh, hatchlings there, but um, the jury's out as to whether they were locally hatched or whether they just moved there from from another location. And that's that's kind of the sort of thing we look at later on, but. Um, I'll get into it a little bit later in the talk, but um, there's some fundamental differences between the core river systems and these sort of subsidiary arms that... that... Oh, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Just getting warmed up. Anyway, pie charts were... You can actually read the report online, it comes there with all the detail. And the pie charts to show that, um, you know, red, red was 1978, uh, green was 1986, and blue, blue was the counts we did, and it just shows that it's quite a bit of variation from year to year there, so... Um, and uh, here's, here's the main batch of the data. Um, look, the main, the main points to, to take from this is that the population recovery mode, you, you would expect to see that there would be some change in the age structure, and clearly there is. You can see all of these top ones here. So this is this is all the data together, so that all the crocodiles. This is just the main river, and this is the south arm, okay, one of the arms to represent what's going on. And what you can see there, all right, uh, 1978, 1986, 2015, there's clearly the age structure, it's, it's pushing more to the right, it's more larger crocodiles and more crocodiles uh, <coughs> inhabiting the system, okay? Um, and these little density plots here were just to show this, it's just easy for your eyes to see this, so, you know, red, red is early, you can see how the, essentially the, the, the median or whatever is shifting more to the right as you get older, so um, it just shows that up really clearly. And the other the other couple of things to, to take note here is that there was a, we noticed, um, a really, really poor counts in the two to three foot range, and we sort of wondered about it for a while. But you know, after we sort of finished the surveys, we, you know, we we felt reasonably comfortable the result was real, um, and we think that it's just probably evidence of some density dependent effects going on there. And the idea is that um, you know those crocodiles that manage to get through this section then get then the um, you know um, survive it. Five ship goes right up now. Maybe there's some observed error there. I mean, I think, I think there's always a little bit, but the guy who's doing the counts has been involved with crocodile research for over 20 years, so you know, we felt pretty comfortable that he was seeing things the right way. So. And uh, the, big, the other, the other big, uh, the other big uh, takeaway message here is that there's a lot of crocodiles in the, the sub-adult range between five and seven foot, okay? Now, in, in the more traditional systems like the Northern Territory where you just have a single river, um, they're the animals that are most, uh, other than the, 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 the hatchlings that are trying to survive and get through to, to early adulthood, the other, the other cohort that gets hammered is that, that size because they're the sub-adults and once crocodiles get to a certain age, the big crocodiles don't want to borrow them. They want them out of the river, they want them gone. So lots of fighting, they get eaten or killed or whatever and they have to move out. Whereas uh, with these holding systems that I talked about, the north and south arms, all these sort of sub-juvenile crocodiles are basically one mass in there in, in huge numbers. So. Um, and so you're ending up with yeah, really high survivorship in that cohort, which is not necessarily the case in the Northern Territories systems. And just this is this is a plot. This is just the crocodiles in that cohort that I'm talking about. And you can see this is the south arm. You can look at the, the densities in these arms here is much much greater than what's here. Okay, because mm -hmm. and and the the information or the knowledge says that. Most of those crocodiles have come from here at some stage. They've been born here, if you will, and they've had to get the hell out of there by saying, but they've been able, rather than having to disappear and head off up north or south along the coast, here they've got these arms that they can sort of reside in and sort of you know, wait until opportunity knocks, so to speak. Um, look, I know it's only three data points, but I just thought it was interesting to, to plot the abundance. Now, this is the total, the total abundance for the three years, and it's, it's amazing. This sits on a directly linear line. I thought I'd try and get some of the variation of the system. So each of these dots just represents the different sections. So I've plotted, for each year, I've plotted um, main river, north and south arms, and tributaries, okay, and the odds get a bit of variation in actual fact. 
you get a curve more like that, and it turns out that that kind of growth pattern is, is much more closely aligned with what they found overall for the Northern Territory system. Um, look, you can't you can't stretch three points too far, but but to my mind, it says there's still plenty of growth to go in the system, so it doesn't, it doesn't look like it's slowing down. All right, so the obvious thing to do was to compare it with the river from the Northern Territory. The only one I could find of similar ilk in terms of total linear length was the Adelaide River. Um, so a colleague in the Northern Territory uh, thankfully gave me some data, and, and, and the main thing to see is you, this is Prince Regent here, this is the Adelaide River. You can see there's just a much shorter tail, if you will. There's a lot more bigger crocodiles in here than there is, so the system's much more mature. And also you can see the 620 crocodiles versus 441. So I will say for this, what I did was I dropped one of the arms so that I was dealing with sort of... By dropping one of the arms, the data from one of the arms, it meant I had about 130 kilometres versus 135 kilometres in length, just to get a more sort of exact uh, 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 comparison. So, to take that a bit further, um, I thought, all right, well, let's just have a look at the stuff that really matters about whether a, river, whether a river system is sort of starting to get saturated. And you can see that we found an average of three crocodiles per kilometre, okay, in the Adelaide River, which is considered a river that's, that's um, essentially, the abundance has levelled out, it's considered it's just oscillating and now it's, now it's sort of just maturing, if you will. Um, the Adelaide River's got 4.2 crocodiles per kilometre, okay, so we've still got a bit to go there. Um, the ratio of large to small crocodiles, same again, you can see, um, the house is only 0.6, showing that we've got less, less um, uh, small crocodiles, uh, uh, less big crocodiles versus small crocodiles. Um, and the percentage of five to six foot crocodiles, you can start talking about this south arm, 25% of the animals there were five to six foot. It's only 8% across the entire Adelaide, Adelaide River, so you can see there's something very particular about the way these arms are able to hold on to these, uh, these small, smaller crocs. Um, and the other big standard is when you look at biomass density, Prince we, we, we average out at 91.4 kilograms of crocodile per kilometre. It's 274 in the Adelaide River, okay? And, and clearly, and you can see large crocodiles, I just arbitrarily said greater than 10 feet, we found five, 63 in the Adelaide River. So you can see how there's, this is telling me there's still a lot of growth to go in, in the systems uh, in the West Kimberley. So it um, turns out, well, Messel having done all that work across, he was able to come up with a reasonably robust uh, explanation model, if you want to call it, of, of what's driving a lot of the patterns we're seeing in the West, especially in the West Kimberley. And essentially just comes down to this idea of um, type one, what he called type one, two and three rivers and it's really relative to um, whether a river has major freshwater input and, and by that it means also access to good nesting habitat as well. And the type two and three rivers which are typical of the, the, the arms, those arms that I showed you is you either get no little fresh water, uh, often hypersalon towards the end of the dry season and the type three sort of a bit in between but the bottom line is you get very little nesting there. So. And so the crocodiles that get into these systems are basically migrating across from the type 1 systems. I keep coming back to nesting because it is one of the major, um, it's one of the major unknowns and clearly it's a, a very limiting factor, but at what spatial scale I don't really know for the West Kimberley. Um, the idea is to sort of demonstrate that, you know, in the Northern Territory you've got this classic grassland habitat here and, you know, the, it's just wonderful place to breed. That, that's also the same, but this is more the type of habitat we get in the West Kimberley. It's just this sort of um, ed, you know, grasses on the edges of the rivers in very isolated isolated patches. So um, and clearly there's, there's successful nesting going on there, but to what degree we don't really know, and it's one of the priorities that I've identified for further work. Um, this is just a photo of, of the Roe River, the next one up, and you can see this is a, it's just a small patch. It's exactly the kind of place where crocodiles can nest in the wet season. And the other model that the... the Northern Territory research has come up with sort of a more expansive one, if you will, but the same thing again. Essentially, they, they came up with three factors that were highly significant in how crocodile populations, um, you know, how their abundance uh, expands, and basically came down to the ratio of favoured wetland vegetation, okay, um, and rainfall, okay, and then obviously mean temperature as well. But same thing, it comes down to nesting and, the, and access to good nesting habitat, basically. We did have two other objectives, which I said at the start, um, and they all sort of just came about by doing actual um, surveys, and one was to develop a bunch of standardised methodology, which we've done. We've got standard operational procedures for um, uh, the spotlight surveys and the biopsy pile, and they're going together with a, uh, a SOC that already exists for how to capture crocodiles and whatnot, so we've now got a reasonably sort of um, uh, 
thorough um, assessment, uh, uh, manuals, if, uh, a group of manuals for, for people who want to sort of, you know, engage in crop oil research in the department. Um, and yet yeah, I said we'll put a paper into review. Um, and the other one is to develop skills with the staff and TOs. And now we interacted with the traditional owners on all of the trips, um, and they they were heavily involved. That you know, this is AD Lane. He's he's actually first mate in a Dandy Mangari Ranger. And this is Greg, who's one of the traditional owners from Dandy Mangari as well. And they they came out on the surveys all the time. Um, and it was less about we didn't run formal training per se, but they just got a sense. They loved being on country. They got a sense of what what's involved to do the crocodile surveys. And we see this as sort of a gateway a gateway sort of process to getting TOs ready to do a lot of the surveys of their own. So um, I'll just finish with that. Implications for management, well, it's pretty obvious. There's a healthy crocodile population and they're reco recovering well. Um, water quality is good and there's plenty of food up there for them. Um, we're skimly environments that sort of atypical, so we don't really know where the, where the, um, how the recovery will play, whether it will continue to attract the, the Northern Territory populations or whether you know, there, there may be a slightly different so, uh, structure in, in the river systems. We'll, just have to wait and see. Um, the big, the big issue really is 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 this increased interaction between crocodiles and humans. And to that end, we uh, you know we've only done two systems right up in in a, in a more remote part of West Kimberley. So clearly, we need to um, bring these surveys down here and, and get an handle on the numbers and size structure from river systems closer to the population bases. And part of that is quantifying nesting habitat because then then we get a sense of just how much a crocodile population is going to come down the coast because if there's no nesting that, or very, very limited nesting availability then it's going to slow down slow down their, their advance. So, all right, um, knowledge the state government, uh, WAMSI and all the partners, there's the deep collaborators and of course the traditional owners. So, sorry, it's a bit of a rush, but Stewie going to the five fingers to the death. So, <laughs> <laughs> get through it. Thank you. Okay, hold questions to the end because we're running a bit late to start with. Uh, I think it's good to point out that we are, all of the projects have been asked to work very closely with the traditional owners, both for permission to get on country. We're also really trying to raise the level of uh, ability within the traditional owner groups. I think Alex will talk about some of the training they've been doing in terms of dolphin surveys. And part of the idea, one of the projects we're running is trying to uh, find projects that the traditional owners, the ranger groups are interested in doing uh, to collect data for themselves. So something 